Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Fernandez and I'm the Director um, of External Relations here at the University of Aberdeen and I'm delighted to be with you all today. This is day four of our International Women's Day celebrations and we've already enjoyed some amazing conversations with some wonderful inspirational women. We're really grateful for the engagement of all of you as you take time out of your day to, to participate in a conversation about how we can all individually and collectively choose to challenge. We're delighted that today we're joined by audiences from across the UK and indeed internationally. We're excited to welcome you all here, wherever you are in Scotland, the UK or beyond. So why are we here today? Why does the university feel so passionately about International Women's Day and the conversations that it sparks? Put simply, um, we, are, we have a clear commitment to be inclusive. In fact, inclusivity is at the heart of the University of Aberdeen. We have set out that commitment in our vision to guide the next 20 years, Aberdeen 2040. The events and the conversations that we have through our International Women's Day celebrations are crucial as we look to consider real life actions as we ask ourselves, how can we raise our game and lead the way to support a more gender equal world? When we thought about the programme for International Women's Day, we wanted to really take on the theme, choose to challenge. And within that, look at how we could challenge ourselves and our audiences around who we approach to be part of International Women's Day this year. Challenge can be difficult. By its very nature, it's not always a comfortable thing to do. But we were keen to consider how we opened up the audiences um, and the conversation more widely. A key to any change is the need to create buy-in, ownership and accountability from a broad spectrum of people. And it, was, and it is with that in mind that we're delighted to welcome our first speaker today. Jeffrey Tobias Halter is our first male speaker at our International Women's Day celebrations. And as such, he offers us a different perspective and insight into the role that men can play in bringing about gender equality. On a personal note, one of the reflections I have um, from the conversations that I have with my girlfriends, female colleagues throughout International Women's Day is that we recognize each other's stories. And I walk away feeling inspired um, and thinking about my behaviors and actions. And, and I can either use those behaviors and actions to support the status quo, or I can actually use the conversations and the learnings to empower myself and those around me to drive change. With all this in mind, over the next hour, we are going to focus on how we can encourage men to engage and advocate for women. How can we support our male colleagues to understand the lived experience of so many female colleagues? Because if we're to create a gender equal world, male leadership has to be part of the solution. I was really struck by an example given by one of our speakers earlier this week, who talked about how so many talented women hit a wall of caring responsibilities, which serves to then limit their career potential. If you don't see the problem, if it's not your lived experience, how can you become part of the solution? I'm delighted today to be joined by Carl Lidecker, the University of Aberdeen Senior Vice Principal. Carl leads the university's work on equality, diversity and inclusion. And I will hand over to him now to introduce our speaker for this event. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Jeffrey Tobias Halter. As Jenny's highlighted, um, if we're to bring about any kind of transformational structural and behavioral change, it really means starting these conversations today directly with you, our audience, and exploring how we can empower both men and women to champion this issue. We've invited Jeffrey to speak to us today to encourage a conversation on how we engage men to create a workplace that supports gender equality. Asking the question, what can you do to be an advocate for gender equality and advancement of women in the workplace? The Choose to Challenge goals are threefold. Celebrate women's achievement, raise awareness against bias, and take action for equality. And Jeffrey Tobias Halter's keynote, Men Choosing to Challenge, 
will invite men into the conversation to become gender advocates for advancing women and provide them with tangible daily tools to accomplish these goals. Now, Jeffrey's keynote will create the sense of urgency needed by organizations today. Uh, we know that COVID and its related effects have set women's advancement back many years. His keynote will also detail the personal barriers that prevent men from becoming advocates. And he will focus on the four key actions that men, that we can take to move from advocacy to action. So now let me introduce Jeffrey. Jeffrey is a gender strategist and he's the president of Why Women, which is a strategic consulting company focused on engaging men in women's leadership issues and helping organize uh, organizations to create integrated women's leadership strategies. He's the former director of diversity strategy for the Coca-Cola company. He's also the author of two books, Why Women, The Leadership Imperative to Advancing Women and Engaging Men, and Selling to Men, Selling to Women. He's a contributing writer to the Huffington Post, the New York Daily News, Working Mother Magazine, and he's a two-time TEDx speaker. His work has been profiled in Forbes and US News and World Report and the Wall Street Journal. His clients, the list is enormous, but includes Walmart, Altria, Bristol Myers Squibb, Bacardi, Citigroup, Deloitte, Novartis, and dozens of other Fortune 500 companies. We're privileged to have him join us today, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Jeffrey uh, to the stage. So Jeffrey, over to you. All right, well, thank you, Carl, and thank you, Jenny, for having me in. Thank you for that uh, very gracious introduction. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to be here today. I wish I could be joining you live. Um, I'm out of uh, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, but it would be great to be able to travel again and, and be able to connect and, and see you all in person. Maybe next year, we'll work on that. Um, I'm often asked, how did a man come to do this work? And, and the, the real short story is uh, my background is in sales. I'm a sales guy, I'm a sales manager, uh, Procter & Gamble and Coca-Cola. And almost 20 years ago, uh, I was working in sales training when I was asked to lead a diversity education initiative at the Coca-Cola company. And uh, I'm a straight white guy. And I really wondered why I was chosen to lead this work. Um, but it was an assignment that I took uh, and was absolutely shocked uh, that I would learn every day. And I didn't quite understand the concepts. And so it was really the start of my journey. And over the next 10 years at the Coca-Cola company, I would have what they call a white male epiphany, where you realize what white male privilege is and the world revolves around us. And then 10 years ago, I launched this company called Why Women, because what I have come to believe very passionately, and, and my work focuses primarily on corporate America, but if men are still 75 to 80% of senior leadership in most companies and organizations, well, then we could actually be 75 to 80% of the problem in advancing women, but we could also be 75 to 80% of the solution. Simply put, we will never drive long-term systemic engagement and advancement for women without active male engagement. And so that's the work that I, that I do today. And so uh, I've got a few slides that I'm going to share with you, uh, realizing that data on this work is important. I realize that we may have more women on this call than men. What I would do is ask you to invite men into this conversation. I spend my days talking to men who want to get better. And, and my belief is uh, 40 to 50% of men actually want to help and support women. They don't know what to do. And, and if we can get 40 to 50% to be really active vocal advocates, then we can certainly get the other men engaged. And so I'm going to uh, get started and just uh, share some, some key information as we talk about this notion of choosing to challenge. And, and it really, it's, it's about advancing this agenda forward. Um, you were sent some pre-work. And this is something that you can take back to your organizations. Uh, it's free on my website. But what we wanna do is shift the context. 
you were asked to take an assessment and I'm not gonna have you share your results, but I wanna debrief it for you very quickly. There were 10 questions that ask how you think about gender equity, and then 10 questions around the actions that you take. And so the important part of this is not where you ended up in the continuum, that's for your self-education. But what we find is most men and most women actually think about gender equity much more so than actually taking action. And so this program will be focused on the actions that men and women can take, as well as organizations can take to move this agenda forward. So don't get hung up on where you actually scored. Just think about at the end of this presentation, what is one more action you can do to visibly and vocally demonstrate that you are committed to advancing women? As I work with senior leadership teams, one of the questions I always ask them uh, is what are the biggest challenges facing your organization today? And, and so that's what we're gonna go on and we're gonna focus on three. I'm gonna spend just a minute talking about the impact of COVID and the long-term effects it's having on our workforce and our businesses. I'm gonna talk about intersectionality for just a moment. And then I'm gonna close out with the barriers and the solutions for advancing women. So let's just jump into this. If you were able to attend on Monday, you, you heard a lot of data around what's going on around COVID and the significant impact that it's having. These are US numbers, but the numbers on a percentage basis are very similar to those in Scotland and, and, and the United Kingdom, Great Britain as a whole. Uh, but this is what we've seen, uh, almost 5 million job losses in the U.S., but women are being significantly impacted more than men, and they're not bouncing back as quickly. Additionally, if you think about the roles that women tend to be in, such as service providers, healthcare, education, food service, um, again, these are roles where they may be on the front lines, actually risking their lives to a much greater degree. A third phenomenon that, that's being talked about is this working from home. And women are just reaching a breaking point. And women have always done what we would call a double-double. And that is they worked a 40-hour week at work or more. And then they would come home to another 40-hour week at home. What we have found in COVID is that this is now being called a triple-double with women working almost 70 additional hours in addition to their full-time jobs. One of the few positives of COVID is that we have actually seen men stepping up uh, much more so at home. However, it's still not to the degree that we're seeing women step up. And this is resulting in just their mental wellness. A year into this, women are actually at a breaking point. And one in four is actually considering leaving the workforce or shifting down to a less demanding job. And then you can start to think about this from a long-term standpoint, your talent base, your future leaders are going to be left behind. The last element is we cannot homogenize this experience. We have to talk to individuals uniquely about what's going on in their lives. So that's one aspect of intersectionality. The second aspect of intersectionality is really a contemporary view. We've been talking about diversity and inclusion for many years, but now we're starting to talk about intersectionality and really being all dimensions of diversity, being important and interconnected. And so even though I'm gonna primarily talk about gender today, we need to understand that all of these primary dimensions, such as age or gender identity or ethnicity or race, sexual orientation, are equally important as are secondary and organizational and cultural. So this notion of leveraging intersectionality and appreciating all these differences is critically important. You're also going to hear me use a term called women of color. And that tends to be, kind of be a US word. But for our presentation, I want you to think about um, literally anyone other than a white woman. And we're going to talk about the importance of intersectionality and women of color 
because every statistic I'm going to provide you is significantly more challenging for women of color and for, and, and for you know, Scotland, that might be women from Africa, that might be uh, women from the Middle East or Asia or really any underrepresented group that is in your organization uh, or business. So COVID intersectionality and then the really long-term impact of what these barriers are. And so there's really a number of barriers that are impacting women. And I'm gonna choose to just focus on five. This information comes from the McKinsey Women in the Workforce study. And this is a study of 350 of the largest multinational companies in the world. So this isn't just US data. This is very statistically valid data and organizations are looking at this and the numbers are overwhelming. And I would actually encourage you to download this report. It's 80 pages and just go through it and look at all of the systemic issues that are combining to just make it seem harder for women to move ahead in organizations. And so the first one we see is that women receive less support from their managers. What does that look like? Well, they're, they're given um, uh, less tools to succeed. Um, their managers don't necessarily help them navigate uh, corporate politics uh, or create opportunities to showplace their work. What we see is men often get more support from their managers. There's an interesting phenomenon called the broken rung. And what we're finding, and again, this is a McKinsey report, that says women are left behind from the very first promotion. For every 100 men promoted in their first job, only 85 women are promoted and only 65 women of color are promoted. So this simple concept of does this really happen? Yes, it happens and it's very validated. Women also get less access to senior leaders. When asked a question, I have never had an informal interaction with a senior leader. 40% of men said yes, they, that they hadn't. 50% of women and 60% of women of color. And we know this is critical because exposure to senior leadership can lead to sponsorship or mentorship. And people with sponsors are 14 times more likely to interact with senior leaders. So this aspect of mentoring and sponsoring is again, one of the aspects that organizations need to get better at. Women also face more everyday discrimination. And this falls into what, again, seems like, you know, fairly benign things, but when it's happening on a consistent basis, it conspires to really make it very hard to advance for women. Um, the number one uh, uh, issue is their expertise or judgment is questioned. And, and this is really fascinating. I actually work with a pharma company that has done work on this. And as they do clinical trials and everything is computerized, what they found is their female scientists uh, research was actually double checked more than the men's. And so this constant double checking and, and really having their expertise judged is a huge issue. Um, women are often addressed in a less than professional manner and men will even make demeaning remarks about them or people like them with them present in the room. And so this everyday discrimination is real. This leads to another concept called micro inequities. Micro inequities are the little things that women experience every day. We call it death by a thousand paper cuts. Microaggressions are real and 64% of women experience them on a daily basis. The most common one of these is men interrupting women. And when we were working live, this was a very easy phenomenon to see. You would just see women cut off or, or ignored in a meeting. And if you don't believe me, go talk to some women and ask them. Um, what we're seeing in this age of Zoom meetings is now we have a device called a camera that when someone else starts talking, the camera immediately goes to them. 
And so one of the things as I work with corporate clients is something as simple as having you raise your hand before you're allowed to talk. And this simple thing prohibits women from getting cut off in the middle of their presentation. Plus, women are often mistaken for someone at a lower level than themselves. They may be the most senior women in the room, and they're rarely treated like that. And then the last one is women are often expected to do more office housework, setting meetings, getting lunch, things like that. So microaggressions are a reality. And then the last major issue is women are often the only one in the room. And, and what that says is just what it sounds like. Uh, in most meetings in, in business, um, being the only is still very common. 20% of women report this to be true, 45% of women of color, uh, and 75% of LGBT, LGBTQ women. And so uh, if you're the only one, there's also a dynamic of a higher percentage of microaggressions taking place and you are forced to cover, to blend in to the majority. And what covering means is basically you can't bring your whole self to work. And so this notion of covering really comes back and impacts on profit, uh, productivity. Here's the last one. And it's really, again, around this notion of women of color are actually having a much more challenging experience. And again, this comes from the McKinsey report. Men and women, white women, who said they were advocates, 60 and six, 61 and 65% respectively, said they were advocates for women. Yet, as you can see from this chart, they don't take any action, such as actively listening to personal stories publicly acknowledging and giving credit for their work, confronting discrimination, taking a public stand. And so the numbers just continue to dwindle. And, and the most powerful number I think is at the bottom, and that is only 8% of men and only 12% of white women choose to mentor or sponsor a woman of color. And so if there's one simple action that everyone can do, it's go out and mentor. A, a woman of color. And what you're going to find is you're going to learn more from her than she is going to learn from you. You're gonna hear about her experiences. You're gonna hear about microaggressions in a firsthand manner. And that's gonna give you the courage to take more action. So these are just some of the workplace barriers that we see taking place. I now wanna close out with this notion of, so what gets in the way of advocacy? What are the actions for advocacy? And so to do that, and these primarily refer to engaging men. As I do my work with men, I find that there are about four major themes to what prohibits them from being active advocates. The first one is a lack of empathy. You know, I see the data, but I really don't know that men and women are having that much of a different experience. So many men lack empathy. Apathy, what's the big deal? I don't understand the business case for this. Uh, quite frankly, my boss never talks about it. So I don't understand what the big deal is. Accountability, again, if it's not important to my company, if my senior leaders never talk about it, if it doesn't impact me personally and my boss isn't asking me about it, why should I care? And then the last one is fear. Men are scared to death that they may say or do the wrong thing. And so it's very easy for men, white men, to choose to do nothing. We can have very long, fruitful careers uh, and, and just even avoid this concept of diversity and inclusion and in intersectionality. So how do we overcome fear? So here are the four solutions and, and what they look like if we're in fact doing those. So the first one, how do we overcome a lack of empathy? I ask men to do a simple thing, listen. 
invite a female colleague to a virtual coffee and ask a simple question. Are you having a different experience in the workplace than I am? And you know, when uh, Jill uh, says, no, 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 everything's the same, ask again. Because what you have to realize is Jill does not want to represent all of the women in the workplace. Ask again. And she may start to give you some bits of information. Don't interrupt her. Don't say, hey, you know, we got a program for that. Just listen. And then ask a third time. And in that last 10 minutes, you're going to hear root cause issues that you had no idea existed. And this is how you start to have empathy. Apathy, you need to learn. You need to read things like the McKinsey business case. You have to operationalize the business case and bring it to life. Talk about it often. Conduct staff meetings on gender differences. And then you can lead. And leading looks like asking tough questions. This is really the choosing to challenge part. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen this a number of times where we won't have any women ready to be promoted. And when a senior leader asks, where are your women? They say, you know, we just don't have any. And the senior leader goes, yeah, I get it. Senior leaders need to be pushing on their organization saying, what are you doing to get some ready? Because there's a war for talent going on. In the next five years, baby boomers are going to be out of the workforce. In fact, this year, millennials marked the shift to being the largest percentage of workers in most of Western civilization. And millennials think much differently. And so they're demanding things like diversity and inclusion. And so leaders need to lead. And if you're not a leader, control what you can control. Can you just run a staff meeting? Can you invite colleagues into this conversation? Can you take one action, again, to move towards more advocacy? And then the last one is fear. How do men overcome fear in doing this work? And, and what I've found is you just have to have the will. The will I have found in most things comes from a personal connection. Though I'm not saying it's a critical criteria, I have found that to be an advocate for anything, you really need to have that personal connection. And so what I have found in this work, and I use myself as an example, it never dawned on me for the first 20 years of my career that if I wasn't advocating for women, I was hurting my mother, my working mother, my sisters, my spouse, and my daughter. Because if I'm not choosing to confront all of these issues that we talked about, I am actually hurting the women in my life. And so advocacy comes from this personal connection. And so to that end, we have a number of tools that you can download and it's International Women's History Month with better time to do this. Uh, if you go to my website, I actually have three pledges you can take. Um, there's an advocating for women, there's an advocating for women of color, and there's a father of daughter initiative. And so print this out, put a woman's name on it, someone in your life that's gonna remind you to go out and do this work and then sign it and just keep it there as a compass to think about why this work is so important. And oh, by the way, it's built on the listen, learn, lead and have the will principles. The last thing I wanna close out is one more tool for advocates. And again, if you go to my website, I've created a, a virtual series called Creating Gender Advocates. And the first module is my free gift to you. So go out, and download for free the Women's Leadership Imperative. And you can conduct a staff meeting literally tomorrow. It's a 30 minute video with a 30 minute discussion guide. If you find it helpful to your organization, there are other modules available. But this is one thing you can immediately do to start having more gender conversations in the workplace. And so with that, um, this is my contact information. Please reach out to me. 
on LinkedIn, follow me on Twitter, send me direct uh, communication if, if you want resources or anything else. I've got a bunch of white papers and other things on my website. So please uh, reach out to me and then also go out and have a conversation. And so with that, we're gonna go back to Jenny and Carl and we're gonna take some of your questions and answers. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, lots to think about um, and lots of questions to ask you. Um, I've got a few of my own, as would be expected, but I'm going to pick up on, because it's a theme that's coming up within in the chat, is around that, the issue around microaggressions that you, you referenced there and how to challenge it. Because one of the challenges I feel is, why should I, as a woman, actually be the one who has to challenge? Because that puts the ownership on me to have the, you know, the confidence and to actually go, do I want to have this conversation? So there is something there around how can, you know, why should it be women who have to do the challenging? Yes. And how do you deal with those microaggressions in the workplace? Yep. Excellent. Thank you, Jenny. And, and I was very negligent in saying that men are the ones who have to choose to challenge. So I don't want to put this on women. I want to put this on the men who are sitting in that room. So that when this occurs, when, when Jenny, you're all of a sudden interrupted, um, I, Jeff, can say, hey, wait a minute, can we let Jenny finish her thought? You know what, I, I just wanna hear her out. This is this notion of choosing the challenge. And it doesn't have to be ultra confrontational. It can be very subtle. Hey, can we let Jenny finish her thought? Hey, you know what? Um, Jenny raised that idea 10 minutes ago and, and we said it wasn't a good one. And, and now, you know, um, Jim brings it up and, and all of a sudden we're reacting to it. So this is this notion of men choosing to challenge in both subtle ways and even, even more visible and vocal ways. You know, I'm, I often get the question from men, uh, what if my boss is behaving badly? What if my boss is demonstrating bad behavior? And, and obviously you have to, you know, you have to demonstrate some sensitivity around that. But what I coach men to do is, you know, seek out your boss and say, um, you know, um, let me tell you what I saw taking place in the meeting. And, you know, quite frankly, Jim, I don't know if you want to be perceived as that kind of leader. Uh, I don't know if you're even aware of how it came across. And believe it or not, Jenny, um, many men are not aware of how their actions are coming across. You know, we, we've been raised, um, you know, most, again, most of Western culture uh, is, is, you know, extroverts, the loudest voice in the room wins, you know, pity the poor introverts uh, or, or, you know, in, in Zoom calls, um, you know, this is really the same phenomenon. So this is one of the big things. I'm not asking women to stand up around microaggressions. I'm actually asking men to challenge these microaggressions. So thank you for that, that question and, and call out. I was just gonna come back because I think that what's really interesting is I don't always think that, that the men will see the, see the behaviors in the room. So there is a real act of reflection and learning there that uh, you know, I, I see it in, in, in meetings where they, there's just that lack of baseline understanding of how certain things can come across. And I think that is that is really difficult because it is it is a it's a journey, but it's a cultural shift that needs to be led, um, you know, across institutions and organizations. Yeah, Jenny, and it actually goes back to the empathy element, right? If you go out as a man and start to have these conversations with women, your acuity is going to go up. And you're going to start to notice things in meetings that you didn't notice before. Um, Bristol Myers is one of my clients. And I made this comment that women's voices are interrupted, you know, eight to 10 times a day. And I got a call uh, about two weeks after my session from a senior scientist at Bristol Myers. And he said, Jeff, you made that comment and I didn't believe you. I'm a scientist. I needed data. He kept a tally sheet in his own staff meeting of every time he observed women being interrupted. And, and by the end of the week, it had happened over 20 times. And he said, holy cow, we have a problem. So here's another simple exercise you can do. It's just ask men to, to be aware of it and take notes. I think you'll, you'll just be stunned at how often this is occurring and you're not even aware of it. 
Jeffrey, we got a question from, I think one of our external participants said, you know, we sent out an invite to this event to a large group of people. We didn't get as much resonance as we'd hoped, particularly from men. And I guess the question is, you know, how can we improve participation? How can we make people see what's in it for them or men to see what's in it for them? Yeah, thank you so much for that. And, and what, what you want to use this data to do and is go out and invite in what I call ready now men. And so I guarantee you, every woman on this call knows one man who gets it, who wants to be supportive, who wants to help. Invite ready now men into this conversation and then invite another ready now man. You know, I, I've been in training and development for, for 20 years and it seems we always train to the lowest common denominator, right? And, and my belief in this work is let's rally the men who wanna do this work, invite them in. And, and I'll tell you, you know, I make this comment, many men wanna help. Um, Amazon is one of my clients. Um, we do a, a seven hour webinar. It's broken up over three modules, but we have uh, 30 men in a room um, talking about how they can be better advocates for advancing women for seven hours. Uh, and, and it's so powerful. There are so many men who want to help. You know who they are uh, for, the, for the women who are listening. They're the good guys. Uh, they're the men in your lives who are supportive. And so invite them in. And the other thing I say is, you know, this is Women's History Month. You have every opportunity to invite a man in. And, and one of the most powerful ways to do that is, hey, I saw a man on a webinar yesterday and he said X. And, and what do you think about this? He said, you know, men want to help, but don't know what to do. You know, Todd, you're, you, you're a good guy. Um, what are your thoughts on this? And just start that conversation. So actually use this event and Women's History Month to start to invite men in. And then send them a McKenzie report, send them a white paper, um, the male advocate, gender advocate profile. You can run that at your next staff meeting and then just, use that to talk about it. And you'll very quickly see who wants to help and support you. I wanted to bring in a question that we've got around advice that you would give to an aspiring female leader um, who is told by a senior male um, that they're loud, overconfident, outspoken. You often read this, that, that characteristics that are seen as positive in a male are then framed as negative, you know, bossy as opposed Absolutely. to commanding. How, what kind of advice would you give around uh, to that woman in terms of how you how you reframe that? Yeah, there's really two schools of thought. You know, one is a, there's a there's a element called the double bind dilemma, and the double bind dilemma looks like this: men can be on one end very assertive, very aggressive, and at the other end very quiet and introspective, and be well respected. Women have a much more narrow, acceptable range. I'm not justifying this. I'm just saying, you know, this is perception because if they're too hard, you know what they're called. And if they're too soft, they're not taken seriously. This, this Goldilocks effect really conspires and it's driven by companies not having good employee appraisal systems. So I'm gonna give you two uh, things for this, this woman to go out and watch. One is a TED talk uh, called Flip It to Test It. And, and it's actually an exercise you can do, but it takes words typically associated with men and applies them to women. And, and assertive is a great word, right? Assertiveness and aggressiveness is often seen as a positive in men and a negative in women. And so the host of this uh, TEDx call says, you know, here's, here's how you need to combat that. So I don't want to take a lot of time on that. Go watch that TED Talk. The other TED Talk I would ask you to go watch is by Carla Harris. Carla Harris is the vice chair of Merrill Lynch. And, and Carla um, uh, was told very early in her career, you're never going to make it on Wall Street. You're just too soft. So Carla, for the next year, was tough. She used tough language. She took on tough situations. And Jenny, at the end of the year, what do you think her boss said? Carla, you're too tough. And Carla pulled out her review from the last year and said, you don't know what you want. 
And so this notion of, and this is really hard, I'm not trying to, to, to minimize this, your leader may not know what they're looking for. And so this is where you have to really dial back the subjectivity and talk about results and make a statement, well, you know what? Um, you know, Tom in our group behaves exactly the way I do. And he got compliments about that. So that's kind of the flip it to test it element. And then I'm going to be totally honest, Jenny, and, and your corporate clients, you know, may, may frown on this. If you don't have a supportive boss who gets you and you're a talented woman, you may have to opt to leave because chances are somebody wants you for more money at a better job. I think an interesting reflection there and, and my own journey. Um, do you know what? It is exhausting to try and be someone else. So there is something, and this is a theme that's come out of, of a lot of the other talks. You need to be authentic and you need to be yourself because actually you will spend so much time tying yourself in knots trying to be something else to, to, to move up the ladder. And actually that doesn't help facilitate change um, going forward at all. And Jenny, what you're talking about is this concept of covering that, that I talked about, right? Which is you're always trying to adapt to other people. And it just ties you in knots. You're not bringing your whole self to work. You're not as productive as you could be. And, and what's really interesting as you, as you research covering is 40% of white men cover. We can't bring our whole self to work because we have to put on a persona as well. And, and so this just is a wear and a drain on everybody. And, and, and you're exactly right. You've just got to be who you are and find the right environment that's going to support and, and advance you. Jeffrey, um, your remarks about women of color have really resonated, I think, with our audience. Uh, first of all, uh, 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 people are really happy that that's been forefronted in this conversation because quite often women of color feel that um, tagged on at the end, particularly in UK events. Uh, and then there's a specific question about uh, whether, you know, we, we gather feedback from women of color in the same way that we don't perhaps when we do surveys and things, we don't necessarily identify the voices uh, the, from particular groups and so on. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about, um, you know, do you see a systematic overlooking of the issues of women of color, of color as is perhaps suggested by one of our questioners? Yeah, no, I think, I, and I think you, you served it up properly. Um, I think, I, I won't say it's intentional, but I think it is systematic and built into the tools. And, and some of this, and I, and I apologize, I don't know the government regulations in Scotland, uh, but I'll use a different class in the US, for example, if you're uh, uh, LGBTQ, um, that is not a tracked element. And so when US companies uh, track engagement, um, they can't separate how LGBTQ employees are being treated. Um, very progressive companies like Deloitte are actually asking people to self-identify and are you then okay in being broken out? So Carl, to your point, I think if you can track it, if you're doing engagement scores, if you're looking at promotions, retentions, you know, all of that data, to the extent you can cut it as many ways as possible, it's just going to be much richer and much deeper. Uh, because what I'll tell you, and, and again, I go back to the McKinsey report, literally every factor as you talk to white women about the experiences they're having, it's exponentially worse for women of color. And, and so that's where you've really got to dig deep and, and have those conversations because it's there. Um, you just really got to push on it. I was just going to pick up on, on that. There's a question in the, in the chat just about the mentor. It's picking back up on the mentoring, but also related to, to women of colour um, and, and that sense that um, it's that it's a construct. So we're assuming that, you know, a man needs a needs a mentorship. A man is deciding that women need mentorship and that they're the right people to do it. So I don't know how how you would respond to that. Yeah, that's funny. Um, even though I encourage you to go out and be a mentor, don't go out and tap a woman of color on the shoulder and say, I want to be your mentor, right? Uh, you know, companies have both formal and informal mentorship programs. Obviously, uh, when I was at Coca-Cola, we introduced a formal mentoring program. 
And I said, I would agree to mentor uh, up to three women, but they had to be women of color. And, and there was a very mindfulness of that. So we had a formal matching system and I did it because I wanted to hear their experiences. I didn't have enough women of color in my circle. Um, if you don't have a formal mentoring program, use this listening exercise to develop a friendship with someone and ask them about their experience. First of all, if you're not mentoring anyone, go mentor someone. Um, more importantly, once you start to have these conversations you know, with, with Monica, you don't have to say, Monica, I'm gonna mentor you, but you can keep in touch with her. You can ask her, hey, how's it going? You know, what, what, are you, what are you facing in the workplace? Because what's really powerful is mentorship can lead to sponsorship, depending where I am in the organization. And, and so as I move up, um, and so, you know, mentoring can be very, very informal a, as well. And so start with a, start with a, a reach out around, hey, I, I, this concept is new to me, and I absolutely want to learn more. And Jenny, this is one of the really key points as you go out and want to engage men in this, many men are uncomfortable with that very first conversation. And, and all I will tell you is it, it gets easier. And the, and the best thing you can do is show genuine intent. What I have found in doing this work again for 20 years, you can literally approach anyone who is different than you and say, I'm trying to build my awareness around this concept of I'll pull Black Lives Matter out of the air. Um, can you share with me your perspective? What are you experiencing? What does that look like? What don't I know? And if you approach that in a very genuine manner, nine times out of 10, the person you're asking is going to be very supportive and, 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 and choose to help you. Jeffrey, um this is a university event and there are, we're inevitably getting some questions about how we respond as a university to some of the, the, the issues that are being raised. Uh, but I'm very conscious that this is the, our audience isn't simply a university audience. So, uh, so we're not going to focus specifically on university you know, matters, but perhaps I can broaden out one of the questions that's been, been liked a lot and is quite popular, which is about, um, you know, a number of senior women in, 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 in a, a part of an organization who don't get the top job, say, in that part of the organization. Uh, and it's a question, around, and then a man is hired. And the question is, you know, how um, about the training of women for leadership? What, what, what are the, uh, I guess it's saying, you know, it's asking, you know, when will the university commit to training women for leadership positions? Yeah. But, but how, how, how do you see that? leadership training being a part of the mix here? Because we had some really good stuff about that on the Tuesday night session from some of our yeah. own colleagues. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. Um, typically, I choose to focus on working with men and fixing the programs and the systems. Um, there are a lot of uh, consultants who do this work, a lot of women, and, and uh, they do this work around, you know, uh, Jenny, if you had one more skill, if you had one more competency, you know what, you'd really be more promotable. And, and my belief is you're probably promotable now. It's the systems and the programs. And what this does is, is it actually feeds a woman's belief. And, and there's great research on this that says when a job comes open, if there's 10 criteria, Men will raise their hand if they need five or six. And women will wait until they have all 10 before they feel they're qualified to raise their hand. And, and so what, what I would actually challenge um, the university systems companies is really on what is the criteria for moving up and aren't women meeting that? What are those subjective elements? Um, there's some great research. I would actually encourage your, your folks, another great research piece to go out and read. It's by Harvey Coleman called Empowering the Organization. And what Harvey found is that in high performing companies, you know, everyone has a belief that meritocracies work. 
that the cream just rises to the top. Well, believe it or not, in high performing cultures where everyone is an A++, performance is only 10% of the reason people move up. 30% is image, not the way you dress, but what do people say about you, particularly when you're not in the room? And then the remaining amount is about exposure. Do people know who you are and what you're about? Because I don't want to say that senior leadership or the top of the organization is a boys club, because we know women have made that, you know, underrepresented groups have made that. But it is a club of sort. And we're not going to let you in that club unless you meet certain criteria. And many times that criteria is very subjective. Because if it was purely objective and measurable, my belief is we would have gender parity because we know women perform equal to men. So, so it's challenging that subjectivity around why it's taking place. And then, and this is a fascinating one, and, and I would actually say I've been in both places. Um, you know, I, I know in France, for example, that they actually put a quota in place to have women initially in 40% of board roles and then 50% of corporate board roles. And I think Great Britain has some other comparable element that, that, that they're tracking. Um, and, and the first thing businesses in France said, oh my God, we'll never find the women. And you know what? Eight years later, they found the women who were just amazing. Because anytime we say we want 50-50, there's this mindset that says, oh my gosh, we're going to promote people who aren't ready to be there. We're just going to promote token women. And I would really push on that and say, I can't count in 40 years of business the number of men who got ahead who were not capable or not ready. And that's that real double bind dilemma that we promote men based on potential and we promote women based on results. So it's a very complex question, but directionally setting goals towards 50% and then asking questions, what do we need to do to get there? I think is the solution. So so I hope I answered that. Yeah, I've got another one. If you're happy for me to go, Jenny. Um, Do you have examples to share where male allyship has led to some positive change? Or can you point people to some research on that? Oh my gosh, absolutely. Um, if, if you go out and look at, um, uh, there's a website called Diversity Inc. Uh, and it's again, it's large multinational companies and they profile the 50 best companies for promoting women. And literally every one of them has some type of Uh, engagement activity around uh, training men in gender equity or being better allies or being better advocates. Um, IBM is a great example. IBM has been at this work for, um, you know, 30 years, uh, did an excellent job in in grooming uh, Ginny Romanetti to be ready to step up. Um, Very strong women's uh, advancement programs. Uh, Deloitte comes to mind. They have Um, I believe it's six of their top 10 partners are actually women. Uh, So so Deloitte is another one who's been at it for a long time. But if you go down this list, Marriott, Johnson & Johnson, Unilever, L'Oreal, they they all have it. And it's a combination, um, Carl. It's not just um, training men, but it's also getting the programs, processes, and systems in place to create a culture that really, you know, lets that, that lets that thrive. So, yeah, my best example, um, just real quickly, Bristol Myers is my biggest client. Uh, over the course of five years, we've put over 200 men through a, an immersion program, this this full day program, and they are they now have 200 male advocates who are out advancing and talking about advancing women, and. Uh, they just went through a restructure. They, they lost a couple of women, but, but they were, their C-suite level was, was at about uh, 40% prior to this last merger. But that's the other thing that makes this work so tough, right? Is companies are constantly reorging. And if you take your eye off the ball, you're gonna have slippage. 
So, so that's the other, you know, real challenge. Um, I've got, we've got a few questions asking how many men are at the event, which is a good question and one I don't have the answer to. So we're going to trial something and we can just do this while we're answering the next question, Jeffrey, is just if uh, the men in the room, in the virtual room, are able to put their hands up, um, that'd be helpful for us and then we can try and get a sense of how many men are in the room. So we'll trial that. I'm not sure if it'll work, but we'll, we'll, we'll see if it does uh, just to get a sense of that. Um, there's a question, we've touched on it a little bit, but I find it really interesting in terms of there's a question here, but there's a lots of initiatives out there and are in mentoring and programs. And, and, and we have to be careful because too often it seemed as fixing women. And, and the whole point of today is that we're trying to get, get away from that. Yeah. But what are your thoughts about the direct challenging of structures and hidden agendas described to better accept leadership skills and styles that are valued? Because we bring with us different styles of leaderships. Absolutely. And yeah, so it's just a question around how do you bring value to the different styles of leadership that, that individuals can bring? Yeah, this is a fascinating topic. Um, there's a, uh, a book uh, by John Gerzema, and it's called Athena Rising. And, and Gerzema is a market researcher. He had never done work in this area. And he went out and surveyed uh, tens of thousands of people the leadership competencies required for a 21st century workforce. Mm. And what he found, and then he asked people to put a gender to that. And what he found is that the leaderships needed today would be defined as feminine in nature, supportive, collaborative, rewarding, uh, empathetic. And, and so, this is really a shift that I think is taking place, right? Companies aren't necessarily talking about it, but it goes back to my comment that boomers are rapidly leaving the workforce and millennials are demanding more support, more collaboration. You know, the days of command and control are gone in 10 years, mm -hmm. unless this next generation of men keeps them going. And I don't think that's going to happen. And so uh, there's a lot of speculation and, and it's, it's even very true in most companies that are doing very well today. Um, strong, supportive leaders are introspective, uh, are relational, are, are demonstrating what we might define as feminine values. Um, that is really the future. And, and he goes around and, and looks at 20 global leaders, who, uh, global countries that are being led by women and talks about, you know, Iceland as an example, uh, how women were really uh, uh, responsible for pulling them out of the financial conundrum that they were in. So 100% uh, agreement. And then, you know, Jenny, the other thing is uh, millennials are demanding this. You know, millennials are not going to put up with the stuff that, you know, me and my peer group uh, worked under. They're just not. And so they're gonna to choose to go to companies that are, are supportive and, and rewarding. Thank you. And um, we've got time for a few more questions. Uh, Carl, I wasn't sure if you wanted to come in or if you wanted me to pull one in now. You go ahead if you got one. So just feedback, we've still obviously got a, a little bit of work to do on the male audience. So we have uh, currently 12 men on the call. So we've got a little bit of work to do and um, I think what's interesting and it's coming there's a comment in here around um the need for trying to encourage um training for men to become allies so it's just thinking about some of the discussion that we've had here and how do we embed it um, yeah. because i think that's something that keeps coming back is it's it's that training and actually making it something people need to engage in yeah, you know, and, and I would, you know, and, and, and realizing we have so many different organizations on the call, right? But, but I would certainly, I would start small. Uh, I would start that one conversation. I would, I would go into my boss's office, regardless of a man or woman, and said, hey, you know what? Uh, it's International Women's History Month. I've got a white paper here that I would love for the group to read. And let's start to talk about that. And depending on where you are in the organization, those can have really meaningful conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've got a very robust uh, women's leadership initiative already, think about how you can accelerate that strategy and make it more meaningful. If you're at a company, 
that really hasn't done anything yet, you know what, find a senior leader who can get behind this, particularly a man, and invite them in, you know, and, and then, it, you know, it, it starts with a conversation, but then keep that conversation going. Here's the data. Here's what action looks like. You know, how do we start to accelerate this? Um, the best organizations I have found who create change in this space don't do big company-wide initiatives. What they do is they will take one division with a leader who finds this work important, maybe a sales function, maybe an Eastern region sales function. And then they'll skunk work it, to use an Apple term, and do it really well. And then they start to export best practices and, and research. So, so think about if you've got one place you can start this and then multiply those results and start to spread them out, I think that's how you're going to be most successful. But it starts with one conversation. Jeffrey, you talked a little bit at the beginning about microaggressions and there's a little bit of a theme on that as well emerging. What do you have advice for organizations and for individuals in the best ways of, you know, systemically tracking, tackling microaggressions? Yeah, that's a, uh, it, it, pars it partially goes back to having conversations, right? Microaggressions do, do drop when, when you develop more empathy. I think the, the simple, easiest thing leaders can do is just start with more inclusive meetings. Um, what protocol can you put in place to make everyone feel more valued and supported? And, and that's little things, right? It's things like, please raise your hand uh, before uh, you, you speak. It's asking everyone in the meeting, and, and this is particularly true for introverts in the meeting as well, uh, my expectation is I will hear from all of you today. Um, so, so if you're on this call, it's important that you're here. So um, know that at some point in time, I, I want to hear from all of you. Another one is kind of acknowledging and just watching what's going on. Um, hey, Lynn, you know, I haven't heard from you uh, today. Do you have a point of view on this, inviting others in? And so really starting with inclusive staff meetings can, can go a huge step. And, and, and how does that work with this Zoom virtual time? The other one I would talk about is uh, really leading with empathy. And if, if we found out anything in this age of COVID, you know, everyone is hurting. Men are hurting, women are hurting. Um, we're thinking about kids and parents and, you know, there is so much stress in our lives. And what, what smart leaders are doing is they're actually pausing and they're reaching out to every employee individually and just spending 30 minutes. Hey, you know, Jenny, um, is there one thing I can do to make your job easier in this time of COVID? What does, just give me one thing and reach out to every person on your team. And, and it may be really small things. You know what, the 830 meetings just aren't working for me. I'm trying to get my, my kids logged on to the computer for school. Um, but this high touch approach in this age of everybody is just wiped out. And I'll give you one more example. My wife works for a very progressive company. Um, they did a Friday happy hour where everyone had to come up with a non-alcoholic drink for the, for the staff meeting. It sounds like fun, right? Makes sense. This put more stress on my daughter than you can imagine. She's not a creative type. Um, she has a, a, a three-year-old daughter, and they did it on a Friday afternoon when people are trying to wind down. So, so think about even well-intended consequences in this age of COVID can, can be challenging. And then, you know, Carl, the last one I would say is collectively ask your team. You, we've got to be asking our team, what can we do better to support each other? And, and so those little things can, can really go a, a long way. Um, and then start to spread that information, obviously. 
I'm going to pick up something in the chat that, and it's really just a shout out to the, to the men that are in the room. We're really keen to know what the motivations for being involved today and, and attending are. So we're really keen for any feedback as to, you know, what did you benefit from it? Why did you engage? Because like you say, we need to capture that to understand how we can then engage, engage yeah. further. I'm conscious of time. So I was just going to wrap up. I've got a question here that I, I think is really interesting. So this is a woman who's part of the, the Women's Network at Work. Uh, where men outnumber women significantly and um, I'm rarely in the same meeting as another woman. I hear comments from male colleagues asking why they don't have a men's network and feel like women are being favoured. How do we respond to this and help men feel what it's like to be the only one in the room? Yeah so you know so a couple of comments it's funny I actually saw a question pop up in a chat why is my company named why women uh, and the Y represents the Y chromosome so so men and women. I just wanted to clarify it because I, I actually saw that pop up in the chat. Um, Jenny, to your question, um, a lot of men won't get this, right? A lot of men won't get this. Invite the ready now men in. For the men who say we should have a men's forum, I would say you should absolutely start one. What they have to do is they have to write a company charter around why their business group exists and what value it can bring to the company, just like other employee resource groups do. And I have talked to a number of companies who have tried to launch white male initiatives because the white men have felt excluded and every one of them has failed because they really don't wanna do the work. They, they see it as a joke. And, and this is where you need to get the men who support you. If you're a women's resource group, find an executive sponsor, particularly a man who wants to support you. And it, and it can be very, um, very much as simple as, um, Carl, you know, you're an SVP in this company and you've got a daughter. And I want you to be the executive sponsor of the Women's Forum. Uh, you get this, this work is important, and it would lend such credibility if you were engaged in this work. Will you come and support us? And, and that, that personal reach out can go so far um, for, for the men who just don't understand why are you doing this? It goes back to that ap apathy thing. So, so hopefully that's a real quick advice. I know we're, we're coming up on time. Got a comment in the chat here um, from one of our, our male attendees who's saying that they were here really to listen, to learn, um, and then to reflect on how they can feed back to their team, um, which is, is great to hear. Um, and we have some questions around recordings, and we, we, we are recording this session, and we'll be able to make that available. Um, and we will be thinking about how we embed this in our training going forward as well. Jeffrey, I'm going to ask if there's anything in particular that you want to highlight or sum up. Um, we've had lots of questions and engagement. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Um, but are there any final words or thoughts that you want to leave us with? Yeah, you know, I, 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 having done this work for, for 20 years, right, it, it's, I'll, quite frankly, it's kind of easy to get burned out, you know, and, and I have so much empathy for women. Um, women have been trying to advance women for the last 40 years. We've been talking about this since the 80s. Uh, it picked up momentum, you know, around 2000. And progress is just so slow. And, and all I'm asking for uh, organizations to do is to be relentless to make positive change. It's so easy to give lip service to this. It's so easy... I can't tell you the number of senior leaders I talk to who say diversity, inclusion, advancing underrepresented groups is one of our top priorities. But you know what? It's always like number four or five, and it never gets talked about. One, two, and three, drive the business, make product innovation. You got to be relentless in this work, and it's actually absolutely a responsibility of leadership to drive this agenda every day. And then when it's not moving forward, ask tough questions. You know, I, I was a sales guy for 20 years. And since 2000 to 2021, the number of women CEOs has grown from about 20 to 35. And, and on a sales curve, 
that's pretty flat. If I was a sales guy and I delivered those kind of results, you would have fired me. Why do we let this happen with an issue that we know is important, drives better business results, and represents 50% of our employee base and, and probably 80% of our consumers if you're a, a B2C company? So put pressure on the system to be relentless. Thank you, Jeffrey. I think good final words that putting pressure in the system and being relentless and not letting go. I think this week we've heard a lot of really interesting discussions and input, and it is really difficult in terms of how do we then think collectively about how we drive engagement, because we need to be speaking to everyone, not just the women in the room. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you to everyone who's joined us. I hope you've enjoyed it. Lots of questions and we really appreciate your input and your questions. Um, and thank you for your time. Take care. Thank you.